So, Heavenly Father, thank you that, um, thank you again, as I say every week, that we've been able to um, Zoom together, that we've been able to meet like this online. Thank you that um, you've made this available to us. Um, I can remember, Lord, when I first studied Daniel and uh, right at the beginning of my Christian life, and I read that um, there would be a time coming when knowledge would increase and people would move to and fro really fast. And, and uh, when we picked that apart and found that there would be this time, the time that I'm currently living in would actually be coming. And it was an amazing thing. And I almost couldn't believe it because I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine um, the internet. I couldn't imagine uh, the sort of the possibilities that have opened up to us because of it and and i'm in, i'm just in awe lord of the way that you have shown us what to expect i'm i'm in awe of the way that you prepare us so that we're not shocked so that we're not surprised when things start crashing in around us so that we are able to go through the trials and the tribulations of this life um, with peace and and even with joy lord and i'm just so thankful that your word really is um, a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. It really does guide us. And you do really uh, want us to know the way forward, to know the way of peace, to know how to, um, how to live in that peace and how to witness to that peace as we go. So I thank you for what we've seen so far. I thank you for this last session. I ask that you would be pleased with our thinking and our speaking and, um, and Lord, that you would take what we learn and, uh, you know, as I said before, burn it into our hearts, Father, so that we're changed by what we learn about you. And um, I thank you, Father, because you, you promised to, um, to answer the prayers that are according to your will. And that for sure is what you want us to do. So I thank you for what you will do. And I praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, yeah, as I say, this final study next Thursday, uh, how to study. Um, and the reason I want to do that course is because um, I, I don't think God wants any of us to learn about him secondhand. I think he wants us to know him personally. I think he wants us to come to his word and to, um, and to hear from him personally. And uh, I think that that's his way of protecting us too, that uh, of course we come together and we share, and of course he raises up teachers and, and pastors and, and all of that. Of course he does those things, but um, I think that he wrote 66 books for each one of us and he wants us to know him through those books. And so uh, I, I was taught a very simple way of accessing the scriptures and I'm just gonna share that, well, basically that, but some added things that I've, um, I've come across along the way and um, yeah I hope that it will be really beneficial um, and the thing about it is the, the, the why we would want to study at all and why we would want to be even doing this is um, so that we could know God um, that's the thing I mean this this course is called knowing peace but knowing God is the way to knowing peace because he is peace and um, and Jesus said I, I know I've quoted this several times in John 17 verse 3 and this is eternal life this is life abundant you remember he said in John 10 verse 10 I came that you might have life and life abundant and then in John 17 when he's he's praying for his disciples and for those who will come through their word he says and this is eternal life that they might know you the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So if, if eternal life, if abundant life is knowing God and knowing Jesus, then that would be really the, the single most important thing in our life, that we would want to know the God who is life. We would want to know the God who is peace. We would want to know the God with whom we're going to spend eternity. And, um, and everything that I've ever done has come out of that thought that I want to know God and I want to know him through his word because I don't want to know what you know about God. I want to know what he wants me to know about him. And the only way to be sure, to be absolutely sure that I am hearing from God is to pray and ask his spirit to lead me through his word, to direct my understanding, to fill me with wisdom so that I will understand what it is that he wants me to know and the bottom line is he will do that for anybody and 
everybody, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you have done, whatever you haven't done, however unintelligent you are, however uh, uh, non-academic, however stupid you feel, he will take this word and make it so real to you that you will never be the same. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's what I want us to do and to go on to be able to do. The better you know God, of course, the better you're able to encourage other believers. Um, just the pure fact that you've tuned in for six weeks now means that uh, God is going to use you in the life of other believers and um, he's going to use you to disciple others. He's going to use you to, uh, as I once heard someone say, you've got two hands, take a, another believer in each hand and walk towards God with each one of them. And that's what discipleship is. It's walking along the road together and helping one another to, uh, to know God better. And I know that because you're studying, because you're listening, because you're going to read your word, that's what God is preparing you for in some way, shape or form. He is preparing you to be able to go into all the world and make disciples. Um, and uh, he's doing this uh, through his word so that he says in Ephesians, in fact, I've got a, a reference in Ephesians chapter four. Um, he talks in Ephesians about what this all will do for us. Ephesians chapter four, uh, sorry, just quickly if I go there. Um, what he's going to say is that, um, uh, well, let's, um, instead of saying that, why don't I just tell you, <laughs> therefore, uh, ch chapter four, Ephesians four, verse one, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And then verse... Uh, uh, 11 and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some of, as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That was a lot of verses, but the main point of that at the end there is that as we, each of us, grow in our knowledge of the Lord, as we grow, we are able to help each other to gain and grow into the full maturity that we are headed for, that we're destined for in Christ Jesus. And each individual part of the body of Christ, the church, is important in the growth of the whole body. Each of us, every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has a role in the building up of the body of Christ. And the more we know who God is and who Jesus is, the more able we are to do our part in building up the body of Christ. And actually um, that's partly, or maybe even mostly, the work in chapter two of Ephesians, Paul will say that God created work in advance for us to do. So that's, that's part of that work, at least, is the, is the growing up through his word into the fullness of the body of Christ. Um, and uh, the thing is, I know that there are many people in the church today, in fact, I would say the, the majority of the church, especially in the West, um, today think that the word of God is um, not important. Um, that uh, the word is kind of old, it had a place, it's a good old book and it's, it's good to refer to occasionally, but uh, basically it's not for today. And uh, I can remember when I first came back to the UK in uh, 2005, the end of 2005, that God gave me a, um, 
uh, a scripture, Second Chronicles chapter 34, uh, which is about a king called Josiah. And we won't talk about it very much uh, now because we haven't got a lot of time. But what happened in Josiah's day, Josiah came to the throne when he was just a young boy and he set about uh, repairing the temple of the Lord. And while he was, while they were in there repairing and, re and sorting out the temple, they found the book of the law. And it was, you know, if you can imagine, it was in a corner under the rubble and people had just basically forgotten that they'd lost it. And so they brought it to Josiah and he tore his clothes when he read what, had, what God was saying. And uh, when I came back to the UK, I knew that that's what God was telling me, that the word of God is lost in the house of God. That um, the majority of Christians, um, let's say in this country, do not study the word of God. They, a lot of them don't even read it. They rely on someone telling them about what it says. And, um, and the problem with that is that that means we're at the mercy of whoever it is who's telling us, whoever is teaching us. And uh, we are now living in a time when the professing church is being carried along by false doctrine. I don't know if I read it, but um, in this course, but Second Timothy, uh, Paul says the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but gathering together to themselves false teachers who tickle their ears, they will start to be go over into myth and to fable and into all sorts of things. Um, we have a, a, a situation in our day where we are told many different things about um, about God and about the Word of God and about what it is to be a Christian, and um, and one of those things that I hear quite often is, well, you just can't put God in a box, Anne. I mean, I mean, God is bigger. He's bigger than his word. I mean, you know, he, he, he can do more than what you just read in his word. And I want to tell you straight away right now, that is a lie. The word of God is the revelation of God to you and to me. It is his it, His revelation of his character it's who he is and how he wants to relate to us it's what he's done and what he will do and what he's doing right now and it is God literally speaking his word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and in Isaiah 55 he tells us at the end of that chapter that my word never returns empty without accomplishing the purpose for which I sent it this word is what God wants us to know about him if you hear someone ever saying don't put God in a box oh you Bible studiers you know you don't hear from the Lord you you know you, you're just afraid of the spirit well you can look them straight in the eye and tell them that this word is life to you it's life and that God will feed you has fed you and has watered you and has grown you up through his word and that if God wanted you to know anything more about him he would have written it down God wanted you and I to know him, and so he wrote this book. He wants you and I to know peace, and so he wrote pages and pages and pages about it. He wants us to be able to understand this word, and so he gave us a spirit to live within us, to be a down payment, the pledge of our inheritance, Ephesians tells us, that we can know that we know that we know that we know that we are headed for glory, that we are headed for an eternity with the Lord our God, the one who is already preparing us to recognize him, to when we see him face to face, to say, oh yeah, I know you. You are my God and you have already revealed so much of yourself to me. So if you hear anything other than that, it's a lie. If you hear anything that is not corroborated in scripture, it's a lie. If you cannot affirm a teaching from out there in the Christian world, if you cannot affirm it in scripture, do not receive it. Hold it in your hand, maybe you don't want to discard it, hold it in your hand until you can, but do not receive anything that you cannot affirm in his word, because Satan is very deceptive. He is very deceptive. And he will always try to manoeuvre and manipulate the word of God so that it's 
he kind of you know puts a little bit of truth and a whole mass of error and if he can get you to eat and digest that then he can effectively stop your witness for the lord jesus the word gives life first peter chapter 1 verse 23 we were you and i believers were born again by the word of god um, we were born again by it. It maintains us. John chapter 1, verse 4, um, uh, in the, well, verse 1 to 4, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In nothing, uh, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Um, and then go all the way down to verse 14 and the word the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory full um we saw sorry we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth the word of god is jesus christ jesus christ is the word he is the revelation of the thinking and the character of God. He is God in human form. He is the Word. The Word reveals Christ to us. We can't see him with our human eyes. We didn't live when he, he came to earth, but we can know him through this book. Hebrews chapter 1, he upholds all things by the Word of his power. He upholds all things by the Word of his power. That means he upholds you and me. He whispers and we continue. He shouts and we take notice. He upholds the whole, not just you and me, but the whole existence of everything by his word, by his powerful word. You and I have opportunities to speak about this God, but we must know him. And in this day, in this COVID-19 trial, people are crying out for truth. They may not actually say those words, but they're afraid and they want truth. They want something to hang on to. And you and I have the words of life. We have the words of life for we have the spirit of life within us and we have the word of life in front of us. We have to take this word and use it, use it as God wants us to use it, to bind up the broken hearted. To, to heal, to, to come and comfort those people who are in desperate need of comfort. We are here as emissaries of the Lord Jesus Christ, ambassadors for Christ. And if we do not know his word, we have nothing at all to give anyone. Um, all of that was supposed to be the preamble, but I guess it's taken quite a long time. So I want to look today at two Psalms. Um, and, and kind of link them in with what we were looking at for the last couple of weeks in Philippians. Uh, but also to, yeah, to, so we'll look at these two Psalms. We'll start with Psalm 34. So if you could go to Psalm 34 in your Bible, um, we are, um, we're just going to look at that. Um, Psalm 34. Um, David is actually running from King Saul um, and he's in a situation where uh, he decides to pretend that he's mad so that uh, he can hide out with actually some enemies of Israel. And um, 1 Samuel 21 verse 10 to 15 speaks about this time in David's life and he's running scared for good reason. Um, uh, and Saul is trying to kill him, and Saul has the mighty army behind him. And if we only had David's account of, um, sorry, if we only had the Samuel account of what's happening, we might think that uh, David was very clever and got himself out of the situation. Let's actually go to Second Samuel, or First Samuel 21, uh, just so we can put ourselves in a bit of context. 1 Samuel 21 and verse 50, uh, 10 to 15. Um, then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish, sorry, I'm not pronouncing it right, said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? 
David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act as a madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? And uh, chapter 22 goes on to say, so David departed and escaped. Um, and so, as I say, if we, if we only had that, we could probably think, well, that was pretty clever. He just pretended he was mad and so they didn't take any notice of him and they didn't kill him, which they almost certainly would have done if he had just presented himself to them. But when you read Psalm 34, you get David's account of what happened at that time. And David's account is very different to the just the facts of the situation that we are given in first samuel so looking at, at psalm 34 um, i'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 7 i will bless the lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul will make its boast in the lord the humble will hear it and rejoice oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name together I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and rescues them. So, the secret of David's success at that time when he was running scared from Saul was that he, I sought the Lord, verse four, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And then in verse six, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Cleverness by David didn't save him. It was God who delivered him and God who saved him. And the psalm actually breaks quite easily into two parts, the first 10 verses and then from verse 11 down to the end. And what we see is that in the first 10 verses, we get David's experience, mainly his own testimony and the conclusions that we can draw from that. And then from verse 11 to verse 22, what we get is him teaching the truth of that, um, <coughs> of how David teaches others and us to manage the life experiences and crises that come up because simply because we live on a fallen planet. So um, let's break it up even more. Um, we'll read the first three verses and um, what do we see about David? So I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So what do we see about David? David is committed. He is unceasingly praising God. That is a decision that he has made. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Remember Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I think I said the last week or the week before, that is a choice that you have to make. You have to make that choice in advance. I will bless the Lord, David says, at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And Paul says in, in Philippians 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. At all times. That's the response of someone. It's, it's not your own cleverness that's going to get you out of a situation. It's not your own... Um, your own uh, planning it's not your own thinking no matter how bright and how intelligent you are there are some issues in life that only god can deliver you from there are some things going on on this planet that you have no understanding of and god is in control of all of them and you have to live in the absolute certainty that everything that you can see and that you can't see is being handled and provided for and you are being prepared 
to be able to walk through it with joy and in peace. Boast in God, boast in Christ, put your confidence in his promises. That's the message that David is telling us. Look, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. That boasting is confidence. My soul will put its confidence in the Lord. The humble, other people will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Make a decision. Make it today. I will praise the Lord all the time. I will rejoice in the Lord always. I will trust him so, so completely that I will praise him no matter the circumstances and the situation that I find myself in. I will praise him. I will bless his name and I will boast in him. I will make my confidence in him. I will speak of him. I will praise him outwardly. I will exalt him with my mouth and in my living, and I will make his name known as the God who is more than I could ever need. I will rejoice in that God always. And then verse um, uh, three to verse six. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and, oh, let, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Prayer was answered by total deliverance. You see, this is what I think we, we don't really quite believe. We don't really quite believe that God will completely take our fear and replace it with peace as we pray in the way that Paul told us in Philippians. What did he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. The Lord is near. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. In, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what? And the peace of God that passes all comprehension will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Do you really, really, really believe that? Really? Because if we believed it fully, we would be doing just that. We would be rejoicing in the Lord always. We would be presenting our requests to God with thanksgiving. We would be coming to him with every supplication and every prayer. We would be talking to him almost unceasingly throughout our day. And we would be receiving from him the peace that passes all understanding. And if we truly believed it, we would be doing it. I think I said one time, we have a lot of fear because we have a lot of unbelief. And you, we can be believers and still have unbelief in various areas. Prayer was answered with total deliverance, David says, not necessarily from the situation, and King Saul was still going to be after him for a very long time, but from all his fears and delivered me from all my fears. David was delivered from every fear that he had. He was delivered. And so the situation didn't change, but his fear was taken. And, and it's not only David. Look at what he says here. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. It's not just people like David who can do this. Everybody can do this. And he, here he calls himself, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. David acknowledged his own weakness. He knew that he was in a fix and he was afraid. And so he cried out to the Lord. And that's what he's saying would be true of all of us. This is not special for me. This is anybody and everybody who cries out to the Lord. They will be delivered and their faces will be radiant and they will never be ashamed. Don't you want to live like that? I want to live like that. I want a radiant face. I never want to be ashamed. I want to praise the Lord and bless the Lord and rejoice in him always. I want to absolutely be confident and, and boast about this God who whenever and, and whenever I pray and whatever I bring to him promises to answer and, and does actually make good on the promise that he will fill me with his peace. Um, 
David didn't have the ability to help himself. That's why he describes himself as a, a poor man or an afflicted man. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. I guess for a lot of people this lockdown is not what it is for me. It's been a blessing for me, I have to say. There's some things I really dislike about it and that actually I'm reaching the end of my, um, not the end, but you know, I, I would rather be able to see my children and my grandchildren and to go and hug my friends. And um, But uh, but it hasn't been the, the trial that it has been for many people. But I know we read the news, we and, and I, I know because I hear from lots of people that that this is not always, this hasn't been a blessing in, in the way it has been for me, that it has been a difficulty and a trial and there has been lots of attendant problems that came because of this lockdown. And um, my answer is always the same, my, my, uh, my advice, my answer, my everything is always the same. Commit yourself to unceasing praise. Find your joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, even when you don't feel like it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and you will know his peace. Um, it's for God's glory that he answers prayer. It's for his honour and his glory. He's told us that he answers the prayer of his people. And so he never breaks a promise. If God breaks a promise, then he's not the God who's, who we know and who, who we love and who we've believed in. God never breaks his, his word. He never breaks a promise. He answers our prayers for his own glory, for his own glory and for the witness of Jesus Christ. And your prayers, therefore, I mean, you should be so thankful for this. I'm so thankful for this because my prayers are just insipid, ridiculous sentences most of the time. My prayers don't have the depth I would like them to have. They don't have the resounding quality that I'd like to have. They are simply, Lord God, would you help me with this? Would you please take this? Would you do this? Would you do this? Will you help me to be what you want me to be? All of those, just a cry. This poor woman cried and the Lord delivered her from all her fears. And that's for you too. Whoever you are, and however you pray, God, God doesn't, the answers to your prayers do not depend on your prayers themselves. The answer to your prayer depends on the one to whom you pray. Your prayers are not powerful. I think I said this last week, so I won't go into it too long. I, I hear that all the time. Prayer is powerful. No, no, prayer is not powerful. God is powerful. God is powerful. Prayer is simply a conversation. Prayer is you coming to God and pouring out your heart to him and asking him for things that you cannot do and telling him about your life and telling him how much you need him and loving him verbally by telling him, you know, who you know him to be and how you long to know him more. And would he help you to do that? That's prayer. And God is the powerful one who will answer that prayer. Verse 7 to 10, uh, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear, fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. This is David's testimony. He knows this. He's lived this, and this is his testimony. And the thing about his testimony, which we can really learn from, is that it rests on God, on the unchanging truth of God. Your testimony, your own experience of God, is wonderful for me to hear. But if you don't base it on a truth that is, is, is a, a fundamental truth of who God is, then it's nice for me to hear, but I can't um, hold it for myself. When we share testimony with one another, it must be about who God is, who God is, and how he worked because of who he is. That's what David says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the fundamental truth. The Lord is good. Taste and see. 
How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We can take refuge in God. How blessed you are. If you do it, fear the Lord, reverence him, all his saints. For those who fear him, reverence him, live in awe of him, there is no want. This is the promise of God. It's David's testimony based on the promises of God. And he's sharing what happened to him, what really happened to him. He was delivered from all his fears. Um, and people need to know that from you. They need to know that from you. They need to know that you know a God who makes good on his promises. They don't just need to know the promise. They need to know that you have experienced the truth of that promise for yourself. That is a powerful, powerful testimony. The writer, um, uh, uh, David, says here that the angel of the Lord um, travels. He says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. And it's a little bit, David means... Um, he has the idea of a camper van, you know, the angel of the Lord is following with you in a, in a camper van and he's, he's, he's camping around you. Um, you and I, uh, we don't need that, for we have the spirit of the Lord within us. So we have the Holy Spirit within us. And um, uh, uh, so the angel of the Lord, if you want to say that the spirit um, shows himself as an angel sometimes then we have the angel of the Lord encamping in in us and around us we have what David is talking about and everybody's invited to the table that David is laying the testimony table of his experience with God everyone's invited oh taste and see that the Lord is good taste and see Everybody and anybody come and find the all-sufficient God. That's what he's saying. Come and find this God who will be your refuge, who will deliver you from all your fears. This God who makes promises and always keeps them. This powerful God who will make your face shine radiantly and in whom you will never be ashamed. And then he moves on, as I said, he moves on to teach us some things. Verse 11, come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So what does the fear of the Lord look like? You know, we want to know, OK, what does it mean to fear the Lord? What does it mean to reverence him and live in awe of him? Well, you know, there's a pretty good outline here. Guard your tongue. It means that you guard your tongue. It means that you don't, you know, spill words out of your mouth that are not thought through before you say them. Guard your tongue. Depart from evil and do good. So all the things you know that God doesn't want you to do and, and, and that God calls evil, depart from them and do good and seek peace and pursue it. Keep on seeking peace. And 15, verse 15 to 18, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I mean, I wish we had much longer with this psalm. We don't because I especially want to get to the other psalm. But, um, uh, but look at what he's saying here. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. Do you know what that means? That means that you who are called righteous in the Lord Jesus, his eyes are always on you they are always looking towards you the eyes of the lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry god hears your voice he hears your crying he hears your calling to him he hears you he sees you and he hears you and um you are called righteous why because you have put your trust in the lord jesus you are reconciled to God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Now we have peace with God because we are reconciled to him through the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new create, creation. 
the old is gone and the new has come. And then in verse 21, that same passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You stand righteous before the Lord God. You are called righteous because you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus. And now and forevermore, the eyes of the Lord are towards you and his ears are open to your cry. I mean, really, is there, is there much better than that? God sees you, he hears you, he knows you, and he wants to answer your prayers. He wants to deliver you from all your fears. He wants to fill you with joy. He wants your face to be radiant. He wants you to know peace. He wants you to know peace and he wants you to know it today, tonight. He wants you to know it now. He wants you to know that deliverance from all your fears. He wants you to take refuge in him. He wants you to crawl into his arms knowing that he will not put you down and let you alone. He wants you to know his love and his peace and his joy and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his deliverance, everything. He wants you to know it. And when we uh, trials come, when we face trouble, he wants us to pray. Pray. Why? because he is near. Remember Philippians chapter four, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Um, the Lord is near, not just close, not just, um, uh, not just um, uh, close to us, but he is near in terms of he wants to be helping us. He wants to be bringing us into this, the uh, state of being that we long to be in um, and our prayer is effective because he is close and um, and that he never leaves our prayer is effective because Jesus Christ is our nearest relative you know um, last Saturday it was a difficult session on repentance for the nation is it biblical and um, one of the things I said last Saturday was that actually uh, you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ we are aliens and strangers on this planet. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are here as representatives of Jesus, as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We don't belong here. We speak a different language. We, you know, all those different ways that you can uh, think of to understand the fact that uh, we belong somewhere else. And, um, um, and so we are now part of God's family. And Jesus is our closest ref, uh, re relative. He's the next of kin. He is um, uh, the one who is closest to us. And what Jesus has promised us is that he is actively making our trials his. That's what the next of kin relationship is. It's that, it's that he takes on our trials for us. He lives within us by his spirit. He has promised that by his spirit, we can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He has made promises to me that his spirit will never leave me nor forsake me, that he will enable me to endure no matter the temptation or the trial or the test. He will enable me to endure um, that trial, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He will never leave. He is the God of all comfort. He comforts me in my afflictions. He will always be more than sufficient for what I need. He is our advocate. Hebrews will tell us Jesus is our advocate. He is the one who speaks for us. He is our intercessor. He is our high priest. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He began our faith and he will perfect our faith. He is the one who has identified with us in all our trials. He has taken all of our sin and paid the price. And now, now, he's not leaving us in a corner on our own saying, do your best, you know, and I'll see you in heaven. He's actually living within us and enabling us to live the way he wants us to live, to live with power, to live with peace, to live with joy. He is the one who cares, the one who sees, the one who hears, and the one who will always deliver us from all our fears. And then finally, just before we go for the, um, the clapping, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. 
He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. That's held guilty. Remember, just think about what you know from the New Testament. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I, we may have to go through many afflictions because we live on this planet, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. Not deliver us from the from the consequences of some of those afflictions. Yes, we'll be sick. Yes, we may even die. Yes, we'll have trouble in this life. Yes, those things will happen. But the spirit of us, the soul of us, will be delivered out of the difficulties and the trials. Um, God is the judge of all the earth. He will judge eventually the wicked. He will, um, he will judge the world. That's where we're headed. You know, one of the teachings we have today is that, you know, the church is going to uh, just be great and we're going to um, make the, turn the world for Christ. And then when, when we've made it all perfect, Jesus will come back. That's a lie. It's a lie. It's actually in the details of it. Sometimes it feels quite good because it's a real a kind of a call to battle and, and we can fight evil and we can defeat evil and, and we can make everybody, we can turn the whole world, the society that we live in to, to love God. We can, we can influence government and education and all the various areas of life and Christians are going to take over the world. That's a lie. It's a lie. We're not going to take over the world. The world is going to get darker and darker and darker. The world is going to get more and more wicked. People are going to turn more and more from the Lord. We are to call out to people to come to know the Lord Jesus. We are to continue to give the gospel to everyone and anyone because we know that the darkness is going to get worse and that as we approach the end, these trials are going to increase in frequency and in severity. And then there will be a time of judgment called the Great Tribulation before the Lord Jesus comes back. And on that very somber note, we're going to stop for the, um, for the clapping. Um, God is the judge of all the earth and he will judge all the earth. There will be a, um, a calling to account and, um, and, and God will have the final say. But until then, whilst we are here on this planet, while we are determining how we should live, we are told over and over and over again that we have a saviour. His name is Jesus. He has gone before us. He has provided for us. He has prepared everything that we need. And all we are called to do is rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. Um, we'll take a break and we'll come back in, um, well, by five past eight and we'll start again. Father, thank you that, um, thank you that uh, we can know from your word that uh, we only have to cry out to you and you will answer. Sometimes, Lord, it seems like you don't answer or we don't hear what we want to hear, but for your promises that you hear our prayer, that you see us, that you know everything about us and that you will be all sufficient, God. You will provide everything that we need and that you will give us the peace that passes all understanding as we put our trust in you. And so, Lord, it's I guess it's up to us really to learn how to do that. And um, and so now as we go into what will be the second half, would you please um, just take the words that I've prepared and and give them a coherence that, that I haven't given them maybe, or, or give them a clarity, Lord, um, so that we all understand what it is you would have us know in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So um, uh, from Psalm 34 then, you can see that David um, had that experience with God and he was delivered. And then he went on to testify to, uh, to, to make his testimony or part of his testimony of that experience. And then he was trying to teach other people through what he had experienced um, about God and about how to live with God. And, and really, I suppose that's, that's 
more or less the Christian life, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we learn about God through difficulties or, or good times and um, and God makes himself real to us um, and, and we start to understand more about him and then we're able to praise him for who he is and then we're able to testify not only to our own experience but to who he is and then um, we start to be able to share with other people and teach other people you know how it is that we live now in the light of the experience we had and that's really what David did and so let's go back to the new testament um to philippians chapter four where we were um verse eight and nine um which uh takes us on to we did it last week finally brethren whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is of good repute if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise well on these things Things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Um, sorry, just a minute. I'm going to mute everybody because um, I don't think everyone's muted. Yeah. And the God of peace will be with you. And now go to uh, Colossians, just another book over, Colossians chapter 3, and read verse 15 to 17. Uh, Colossians 3 15 to 17 let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God whatever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father I mean that's pretty much what we've just been seeing um, David doing in his psalm. Um, and, and what I wanted to kind of think about is, um, this is an instruction in Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule. That means do it, do it as an instruction. And so if Paul's got to instruct us to do it, that must mean that God knows that we don't let the peace of God or the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And so why would I not be letting God's peace, Jesus' peace, rule, i.e., you know, have the, the, the prominence in my life? Why would I not, not be um, allowing that to happen? And um, really, I was thinking about it. Why would that not be? And, and the only thing I could think of is that actually I'm not trusting. And I'm not trusting because I don't believe. Or because I haven't learned how to practice trusting. And, um, and so I, I really wanted to spend a bit more time on that and in our final session, really, how do I actually do what I'm called to do? How do I um, focus on those things? You know, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are noble. How can I train myself to actually do that? How do I remember to not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, present my request to God? How do I, to, how do I do what Paul says in Philippians, practice these things, whatever you have seen and heard, whatever you have learned and received, practice those things and that's what i think we have to remember this is a continual practice this isn't just something that will happen this is something we have to commit to doing and um and, and when we do it even our most feeble attempts what we will find is that god makes good on his promise he won't give you peace unless you trust that he is the one who gives peace he won't give you peace if you are kind of not, not, you don't know him or you're not trusting him or you've decided you don't believe that about him. Because God wants to further your faith. He wants to deepen your faith. He wants to stretch your faith. And so he will consistently continue with you until you and I get to the place where we say, OK, Lord, I am going to rejoice in the Lord always. I am going to commit myself. I'm going to bless the name of the Lord. I'm going to make unceasing praise of my God. Um, remember, you know, the opposite of peace is fear. The more fear you have, 
the more you need to be practicing the things that Paul has said and the more you need to be taking to, to heart to let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. That there's an instruction that, and there's something that you must do, you must practice. And, and you, you know, that begins, of course, by crying out to God because we don't know how to do these things. We don't know what we're going to do. And when we're afraid, we get into a panic. And so what, um, what we're looking at is we have to practice, um, practice, uh, doing what God tells us to do and and I think we saw, saw last time every battle and is and each enemy is different you know when we saw Israel going into Jericho they they had a tremendous victory and then the very next time they didn't consult with God and then they had a defeat there because God is wanting us to keep on coming back to him to keep on asking him to keep on doing the things that he is telling us to do and um, just because we overcome one fear doesn't mean we won't have another fear we're fearful people that's who human beings are and uh, and some giants of fear will always stir us up you know some problems are are just are going to make us afraid so first of all remember just think about it fear is not sin fear is not sin it's how you respond to the fear of something else that is a, the determining factor how do you respond to the fear in your life the situations that bring you fear and if your response is to rejoice in the Lord always, to be anxious for nothing, then the fear itself will flee. We'll have to run. Each encounter with a giant or a trial will um, require strength and courage that you don't have, that you just don't have. And, but don't kind of get discouraged by that. None of us have it. None of us have it. You know, I, I hear that a lot. You know, we've got to be like Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Every place the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you. Be strong and courageous. And we all kind of must try to muster up this strength and this courage. We don't have it. Joshua is not you. He's not me. Joshua is a picture of Jesus. He has strength and courage. And he promises to give that to you. He promises that by his spirit, he will enable you to have the courage to face the enemy and to have the strength to overcome. That's what he says, isn't it, in Romans 8, that uh, we overwhelmingly conquer through Christ who loved us, that we are victorious in and through Jesus. But you and I will never be victorious on our own. You are not strong enough. You're not brave enough. You don't have the courage. That's why God wrote all this about fear and about remembering who he is, and about practicing who he is, and about just uh, doing the things that he's telling us to do, because we will always be undone by the situations in our life. We can't beat the giant standing in front of us. The only way that we overcome is through Christ Jesus. The only way the giant, the thing that's causing us fear, takes its rightful place is when God is made big in our mind, when he is made so magnificently huge that suddenly the problem that we see in front of us becomes like a, a tiny mouse. Faith is what pleases God. It's not that you can do everything. It's not that you have the answer for things. It's that you believe he has. That's what pleases God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Um, for without faith it is impossible to please God. Um, for he who believes... Oh, oh, sorry, so annoying when I don't get that right. Hebrews 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Do you believe that God rewards those who seek him? Do you believe that if you come to him, asking him for the peace you don't have, asking him for the courage you don't have, asking him for the strength that you will never have, do you think that he won't answer that? That's exactly 
why he has brought you to the place that you find yourself. Because he wants you to grow in your trust of him. He wants you to understand who he is and what he has promised. Faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. And how will strong faith be uh, accomplished? By exercising it. The more trials you face, the more you have to turn to God, the more you will find your faith strengthened and developing. First Peter chapter 4, um, Peter says, uh, sorry, let's just go there. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. The more that you are going on with the Lord, the more trials you're facing, the more suffering that you are um, sharing in, the more glory, the more exaltation will result. Look at uh, James chapter 1 verse 3. You know, James was the first book of the Bible that I ever studied after I became a Christian. And um, and I just want you to imagine what this verse did to me then. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. I could not get that verse out of my head for uh, for years. Consider it joy when I encounter trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Can you see what James is saying, what God is saying through James? When you face a trial, consider it joy. Why? Because in that trial, God will produce in you in in endurance. The testing of your faith will produce endurance. And that endurance will have a perfect result. What will that be? That you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God uses every trial in your life to make you mature, to make you into the image of the Lord Jesus. Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So when fear attacks, instead of running from it, just use it to remind yourself that 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 fear has to be faced with a truth of God, a truth about God. And as we face that fear with the truth of who God is, we overwhelmingly conquer, as I said in Romans 8, through him who loved us. We remember the truth of God and we, and remembering doesn't just mean remembering it in our head, it means acting upon it. When you read the word remember in scripture, it means taking action based on what you remember. So when you take action because you have remembered a truth of God, what that means is you are acting upon the truth of God and actually putting into practice what you know to be true about God. And it's only by repeatedly having to do that, that we begin, we begin to start to understand how we walk in this peace that passes all understanding, how we continue with this God who has promised us peace. Um, And we learn not to fear. There's Peter chapter three, verse six. Um, Peter says in, um, Uh, uh, that we become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So we become, we, we, we move into that place where we are not afraid because we trust that God is who he says he is. I want to finish, um, it's quite a long finish, but I want to finish with a, an experience, actually an example in the life of, um, a really uh, dear friend of mine, um, a lady I met in Japan and who still lives there, Japanese lady. And um, she's given me permission to share this. And I uh, think it, it might be a good way to um, finish um, this course on knowing peace. Um, a few years ago, actually, probably, I don't know, maybe even eight, nine years ago now, I received a card, uh, a New Year's card from her. And um, 
and I emailed back asking how she was doing. I'm not very good at staying in touch with people. And so my emails or my cards are probably once every two or three years. And, um, and uh, I emailed her and said, how was she doing? And the next day, this is what I received back. And I'm going to read it because I, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. I'm at a very low point. I cannot sleep because I live in fear. My parents are getting old. My mother has started showing the symptoms of Alzheimer's. My father has osteoporosis, so that one fall will cause him to be bedridden. They are living alone up in the north, shoveling the roof high snow every day. If and when one of them has a problem, which could be at any moment, I will have to move and live there, where there is no live church. I will be cut off from all Christian teaching and fellowship. I cannot bring my parents to Tokyo because they keep their alertness by keeping themselves busy by doing the housework and gardening, etc. Also, I'm scared that they will die without knowing him and I will never see them for eternity. My brother lives in Tokyo without work for seven years due to depression. He has no intention of going back to care for them. His wife prostituted herself to buy jewellery and left him. He is taking care of their son. My parents have been supporting him financially out of their pension. They are broken hearted at his condition. I see their sorrow and hopelessness. I have been sharing with them the hope in heaven, but they don't seem to respond. I wonder if they were not chosen at all. My oldest does not believe. I thought my second son believed, but since he left home for college, he has not gone to church, he does not read the Bible, he does not show interest in God. I wonder if I lost them. I want to trust God, but however much I try and tell myself I should trust, trusting God seems so far away and impossible. I see my faith close to nil, and I know that without faith it is impossible to please God. I live in fear. I have no joy. I'm consumed by the thought of running away. I cry out to God when I wake up so many times a night, but the next night is the same. It seems there is a great barrier between God's word and me. His words do not sink into my heart. Um, when I got that uh, email, I wrote back to her, um, just a line or two saying I would pray and then I would reply in a day or two and then I asked the Lord what I would say you know to be honest my first thought was well what on earth can I say that she doesn't already know um, she studies the Bible and she knows the promises of God uh, but I couldn't think of anything else but his word and as I said earlier actually um, of course many of us have experience of that we're faced with a, with a person whom we love, who's sharing their burden with us, their problem, and we just don't have any words. You know, human words are just not enough. And, um, and that's where I was with Michiko. And a day or two later, as I was reading, um, just in my regular reading, uh, I was reading Psalm 3, and somehow the words seemed perfect for her and for all of us actually now I've used this so many times it's been such a, a testimony that I've been able to use with her permission um, it's perfect for all of us who find ourselves facing an enemy who knows exactly where the weak spot is and hits us when we're at our lowest ebb so would you go to Psalm 3 um, Psalm 3, and um, I'll just read the psalm first. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for
for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Um, this is uh, another Psalm of David. We looked at Psalm 34 in the first part. And, um, and this is at a time when one of his sons, Absalom, strangely, is uh, attempting to take the throne of Israel from him. And um, David is being forced to run for his life again. And um, as he begins this Psalm, we, uh, he recognizes that his adversaries have not only increased, but they're actually rising up against him. Oh, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me, uh, taking action against him. And they're emboldened, actually, because they're following his son, who they think is going to be successful in taking the throne from David. And, um, and he, he's facing what looks like defeat at the hands of his enemies. Um, if you know anything at all about King David, you know that he headed up a very dysfunctional family. He, um, he, uh, his eldest son raped his daughter and David did nothing about it. And then he was murdered by um, other sons. Um, he favoured one child over another. He turned a blind eye, as I say, to this rape. And he, he's not the sort of man that you or I would have chosen to be the first king or the king of Israel. But God looks at the heart and, um, and God called David a man after his own heart. Um, and, uh, you know, for the longest time, I tried to figure out how God could call David a man after his own heart. When David, as I say, he was just, it was one disaster after another. And then I looked at Psalm 51 and, um, uh, and I realised why it was that God called David a man after his own heart. If you look at Psalm 51, verse 4, against you, God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David knew he sinned against God, and every time he sinned, he turned back in repentance and confession. He turned back to God accepting his sin, acknowledging his sin, asking God to forgive him of that sin and taking whatever punishment of God, whatever God said was the consequence, David said he would take because he knew that he had sinned against God. David knew God and he trusted him. We see that all the way through the Psalms. He made so many mistakes. He had so many enemies, especially at the beginning of his life. But he consistently and constantly turned back to God. Faith is what pleases God. Faith is what pleases God. It's not how many times you succeed. It's not how many times you do the right thing. It's not how, many, how few times you sin. It is faith that pleases God. It is you turning to him in confession and repentance and saying, oh God, I can't do this without you. I can't face this giant. I can't live this life. I can't know peace unless you, the God who is peace, fills me with it. I can't live this life without you. I haven't the courage. I haven't the strength. I can't even live a day on my own without falling down. It's that that pleases God. And every time we turn to him in repentance and faith, God always answers. He always answers. And in Psalm 3, what we see, we see what this meant to David practically. Actually, he knows that his enemies are rising up against him and that they're saying that God is, um, is, is there's no deliverance for him in God. But David is a perfect example of someone who trusts God. He's a perfect example, not of uprightness and, and integrity. And uh, as I say, he's, he's conspicuously absent uh, some of those qualities in, in varying places in his life, but he has turned back to the one whom he knows is able to deliver him in faith. He has faced the fear that he is, um, he is confronted with, and he has decided to go to the one who is the only one who is able 
to help him. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance in God. And that's what fear does. It, it takes you into a place where, you, where you're listening to the words of the enemy saying, where is your God now? Where is he? I thought he was supposed to be helping you. You're never going to succeed here. And how many times we are tempted to believe the lies of the enemy. How many times we're tempted to think we've messed up, we've failed, we haven't got it right, and now these are the consequences. And this, you know, this I've just got to get myself through these consequences and I don't know how I'm going to do it. How many times when we're facing consequences of our actions or even sometimes the, the consequences of actions we had nothing to do with, we forget that we can always turn to God and he will never, ever disappoint us. How easy it is to fall into the trap of believing that God is not who he says he is, but that actually there is no deliverance in God. Okay, I know I'm saved. I know that I'm in the Lord Jesus, but I can't expect God to deliver me from every fear. Surely I've got to overcome this myself. I've got to be strong. I've got to be courageous. I've got to be this and I've got to be that. I can't cry out to God and ask for his deliverance. But David cried out to God all the time. In every situation and any situation, he cried out to God. How many times do we let anxiety and fear take over? Because we don't do what God has told us to do in his word because we don't actually believe that all of it is for me. We listen to the lies of the enemy, the lies of our past, the lies of our, the people around us who keep telling, st saying stuff to us that is not true. We believe those lies instead of casting them out and turning to the God who is truth. That's where Michiko was. That's where she was. She was full of the, of the lies of the enemy. You're not going to be able to do it. Maybe God didn't choose them. What are you going to do if you have to go up to the north and leave Tokyo and leave your church? What's going to happen? And your kids, they're all going to get lost and God doesn't love them. They've all turned away. And oh, you failed. And what are you going to do? And night after night after night after night, she laid there unable to speak, sleep. But David here in this psalm, he stands firm. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. What did David do? He remembered his God and he took action on what he remembered. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying out to the Lord with my voice and he answered me. I lay down and slept. I awoke. Why? For the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves um, against me round about. So what about you and me? David cried out to God and God answered him and David laid down. So now, what is your situation right now? What are you facing right now? What is happening? What are you afraid of? What is the giant that is standing in front of you? What is the impossible situation? What is the circumstance? What is the ongoing terrible situation that does never seems to change? What is the situation that is tying your mind in knots that you are thinking about at night that you don't know what to deal with, that you, you just cannot get out of your head and that situation and that circumstance or that person or that difficulty is becoming so big that it's consuming your vision and it's all you can think about day and night what is that thing because you have a promise from God first Peter 
chapter one, verses three to five, you have a promise from the God who created all things. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You and I, as believers in the Lord Jesus, are right now, currently, every day, all day, being protected through faith. Through faith, by the power of God, ready for a glorious salvation that will be revealed in the last time. You and I cannot ever fail. You and I will never be left alone. You and I are being protected right now. Whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever difficulty, whatever trial, God will be with you through it all. And he promises that one day you will be with him in glory. Live in the strength of that promise today. Be, speak David's word, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. Let God lift your head, fill your mind, speak out the truth of who God is and what he has promised you. Know those promises from First Peter. I am being protected through faith by the power of God. I am right now currently protected and I am putting on the helmet of salvation. I am putting on the truth of my salvation in the Lord Jesus. I am putting on all that that means over my mind and I am going to withstand the arrows of the enemy. I'm going to pick up the shield of faith. I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to hold it all together with the belt of truth. I am going to know God's word so well that I fit it over myself like armor, just as Paul says in Ephesians 6. Know this word for yourself. Put it on. Speak it out. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory and the one who lifts my head. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves about me, set themselves against me round about. You are my glory. You are the one who lifts my head. I will not be afraid. Why? Because you are with me. David knew that God had crowned him king. He knew that God had given him the throne of Israel. And even though he was afraid and had to run from his son, he remembered that God was the lifter of his head, that God was his glory. Now, you and I, we belong to the Lord Jesus. We have been uh, brought into the family of God. You and I have an inheritance in heaven that is imperishable. It is glorious and it will never fade away. It is reserved in heaven for us. It's like it's got our name on it. You and I have glory awaiting us. What can the enemy do? What can he do to take that from you? It is imperishable, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. What can hurt you? What can come against you? Your spirit is intact in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your soul is being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And yes, this body may be disintegrating. It may be corrupting. And yes, the circumstances of your life may not be what we would call humanly good and may not be what we would call make to make us happy but God but God but God he is working glory in and through your life he is changing you from the inside into the image of Jesus Christ he is strengthening you and strengthening you and through you he will strengthen other people and he will through you teach other people who he is and the, and you will be blessed in the knowledge of him and you will bless other people because of what you know about him. What can Satan do to you? 
consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you will be complete and per perfect, lacking in nothing. That's the promise of God. That's the instruction of God. Consider it pure joy. In Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. In this psalm, it is, he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. What did David do? He cried out to the Lord. I cried out to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy habitation. Verse 5. Verse 4. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 4 to 6. Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where do you live? You live in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You are seated in him spiritually, far above. Look, go up to Ephesians 1, where Christ is, which he brought about in Christ, verse 20, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Where are you? You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all rule and authority and every name that is named in this age and in the age to come. You have victory in Christ Jesus. You need not be afraid because you are in him and he is in you. Tell yourself these truths. This is not positive thinking. This is taking the word of God and standing on it. It is digesting the word of God. It's that verse from Proverbs, no, from Jeremiah, your words were found and I ate them and they became to me the delight of my heart. Eat these words and stand on the truth of who you are in Jesus. I wish I had, you know, I, I wish I had, you know, months and months and months to go on with this. I have to finish because it's quarter to nine. My friend Michiko said that she laid awake at night full of fear about her children and about her parents. And, um, but I read that morning that David decided to trust God in um, Psalm 3. And so I told Michiko that that's what she had to do too. And when I pray or when I put together a message like this one, I always sit at my computer and ask the Lord to show me what to say and to give me actually what to say. And um, very often it comes out in a rush. And uh, that's what happened that day. And I'm going to read to you what I sent to my friend, not because I sent it to my friend, because this came from the Lord, it wasn't me. But it's because I know this is from God to each of us, with all our worries and all our problems. This is what he said. This is what I said to Michiko. I have been thinking, praying so much about you and your email and the fear that has hold of your mind and your heart. I know that this is the work of the enemy of your soul and that there is only one way to defeat him, by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are so many scriptures that I could give you, so many that speak of who God is and how he is in control of our lives, but you have read them all, and I guess your dilemma is, how can you trust that God is and will do all that he says he is, all that he promises? Well, the answer is that he is God Almighty, creator and sustainer of the universe, Nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing is a surprise to him. And there is absolutely nothing that he will not do for you simply because he loves you as his most precious child. Think of how much you love your children, how much you want them saved, how much you would do for them, give up for them, and then multiply that a billion times and it will still not come close to how much God loves them. I know you said, what if they are not chosen? 
But that's not the right question. God wants everyone. Christ Jesus died for the whole world, everyone who has ever lived or ever will live. He left no one out. It is a mystery and we cannot fully understand it, but God wants your parents and your children and the way that he is speaking to them is through you and your faith. Don't let that be another burden to you. I don't mean to make you feel guilty, but please know that God's blessing in your family is you. And I knew that that's what God wanted to tell Michiko, and I know that's what he wants to tell you. God's blessing in your family is you. All that you are and all that you will become right before their eyes. Do not think for a moment that God is not at work. He is right there in the midst of your family and he is doing all that is necessary. I know that your prayers are heard and I know that the Lord will accomplish what concerns you. He has promised that he will work all things together for good for those who love him. That's you. Do not ever trust your feelings. They are not worth a moment's thought. They are fleeting and deceptive and inconsistent. Only trust who he is. Only trust his word. Read it and do all that you can to believe it. And then ask him to fill you with faith. More faith and more faith and more faith until you cannot breathe without trusting him. Michiko, he is God. He is more than we can imagine, more than we can hold on to. He is infinite power, unchanging love, amazing grace, and more and more and more. There is no way to go on except to decide to trust God. Look at all that he has done for you so far. Remember and recount aloud all that he is. Meditate on his greatness and his mercy and then meditate again. Hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When your enemy comes in, hit back with the word of God, even when you are struggling to actually believe it for yourself. God's word has power. It is living and active. It never returns void without accomplishing the purpose for which he sent it. Christ defeated Satan in the wilderness with God's word you will too. Practically, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we do know that God knows already and he has prepared all that we need to face it and get through with the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. I went on with some uh, practical details about her parents and then I said this. For your children, you have given them a gift that is beyond price, a mother who spoke to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. God will take what you have said and will bring it to fruition in their lives. How? I don't know. But I know that he tells us to pray unceasingly, to pray expectantly, and to believe that we have all that we ask of him when we ask according to his will and his name. Isn't that what you're asking for? Then believe, trust him, decide that you will not entertain another thought to the contrary. When those fears come in the middle of the night, Get up and quote scripture aloud to yourself. What about Psalm 91? Remember, you dwell in the shadow of the Most High God in his shelter. He is your refuge and your fortress. You have just forgotten or not made the most of all that he offers you. Run to him, Michiko. I know he will remove your fear and replace it with joy. It might take time and considerable effort, but God promises that perfect love drives out fear. He has perfect love for you. His perfect love lives within you and his perfect love will see you through. I wrote that because that's what I saw in Psalm 3 because that's exactly what God did for David. David trusted God's word. He stood on it, recited it aloud. He spoke out and let its power sustain him. And God's, God, David says God sustained him in verse 5. And that is what he'll do for us if we let him. You have to do these things. I have to do these things. I have to remember who God is and speak it aloud to myself. I have to speak truth to my soul. Because I have an enemy who wants to feed lies in all the time. I have to speak truth to my soul. And the only truth that has power is the truth that I find in this word. 
I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who come against me all around. God, you are my provider, you are my sustainer, you are my protector, you are my shield and the one who lifts my head. And finally, in Psalm 3, David calls on God to arise. He says, I know that you will do what you promised to do. And so I ask you, Lord, to do it for me. You, you and I have to give him our trust. We have to just believe who he is and what he says. And we have to practice it because it won't come naturally. In the world that we live in, with the body we live in, with the mind that we have, with the enemy that we have, we will have to fight this battle over and over and over again. But in the fight, there will be victory. And the result will be peace that passes all understanding. And the actual presence, the experienced presence of the God who is peace. I'll just read you as I finish. Michiko's reply to me just a few, hour, a few days later. You are right. Although I knew what God said, I had forgotten. In the whirl of circumstances, I had allowed the circumstances to overwhelm me. As I get, kept thinking about the problems and the possible scenarios, I had forgotten that I was to take every thought captive and that I was not the one to write the scenarios. I kept telling myself that God is sovereign, but I had really stopped believing it. It's funny how one could do that. Although I read the Bible every day, I had forgotten that God's word has power. Either I had forgotten or I just let it go. In Psalm 3 verse 8, David says, salvation belongs to the Lord. He alone saves and he alone delivers. His blessing is upon his people and his blessing never fails. Make these psalms, make these books, make this word your own. Meditate on it, think about it, recount it aloud, write it on your mirror, whatever you have to do. Just keep on keeping on, telling yourself the truth over and over and over again until it becomes a part of yourself. I think I said in Psalm 51, David always turns back to God and confesses his sin. And what he says in Psalm 51 is what I'm going to finish on um, tonight and finish this course on Psalm 51, verse 6, which actually became the title for the ministry that we are involved in. Um, uh, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. God wants truth. He desires truth in the innermost being. He wants you to eat his word. He wants you to be filled up to overflowing with his word because he knows that his word will sustain you. It will feed you. It will protect you. It will strengthen you. It will do all and be all that you need. Seek after God. Keep on going. Keep on going. Tell him you want to know peace. Make sure you do want to know peace and then keep going and keep learning from him about who he is, about what he's promised. And you will really know the peace that passes all understanding. You will know peace. You will know the God who is peace. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for um, the truth of it. I thank you that you tell me how to remember it, that I just keep reading it and reading it and memorizing it, meditating on it. I thank you that you are there as I do that, that you are always calling me closer, drawing me closer. I thank you that you've written all these books for me. I thank you that you're enabling me and all of us to know you through this word, to be built up in it, to be protected by it, to be loved through it. Oh Lord, all of it. I thank you so much. Thank you so much that you wrote it all down for us. And I ask now, Lord, that you would really not let us go until we keep on keeping on doing what you have called us to do in this course, that we would know peace, that we would know you who are peace, the God who is peace, and that we would live in that peace. 
the peace that passes all understanding so that we can witness to who you are and to the great glory that we know awaits us. And I thank you, Lord, for all of that and want to say that we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.